welcome back to Bumblebee and I hope you're ready to be indoctrinated because today we'll test and tour some of the top 10 most bizarre cults in history. Who knows, maybe one is for you. All right, so we know from my past two cult videos that these are gonna be a whole lot of weird. So let's start strong with universal medicine. So let me break it down for you. This cult was founded by Serge Benhanian, who was a former bankrupt tennis coach from New South Wales, Australia. The first guy that your mom dates after a divorce type of energy. Naturally, like every other nutcase who starts a cult, Ben Hanyan has no medical qualifications and claims he received an energetic impression, which happened while he was on the toilet. And he brings it up in the cult origin story every time as if he couldn't leave it out he started the cult as a result of butt magic energy or whatever. So Serge devised universal medicine's healing practices based on the belief that disease is caused by it energetic disharmony resulting from karma. And from there to esoteric heals everything was not a stretch for this perv. The esoteric breast massage programs that he peddles are claimed to heal everything from painful periods to breast cancer, which of course is the complete opposite of a fact. In reality, it's an excuse to be felt up, and he charges hundreds of dollars for them, preying on someone's fearful mind and body. Add insult to injury, he's a big old ableist, saying disability is a punishment for past lives karma, as is being forced upon by someone else. Skin color evolution isn't karma, but it was a conscious choice and we chose to make our DNA do that. AKA this dude is straight bonkers and has never taken a health or science class. A Supreme Court jury found that he leads a socially dangerous group and is a charlatan who makes fraudulent medical claims. There have been endless cases of neglect and defamation battles with him, yet somehow he's still up and running. This phenomenon may actually explain all religious origins. It's the John Frum cargo cult. Pacific islands were heavily trafficked by American troops over World War II. To Pacific Islanders, it's not just the appearance of soldiers and their wild technology, but the seemingly endless supplies that really made them seem mystic. Think like this. These pale men came out of the sky on giant metal birds or through water on heavy metal that somehow floated. They came here, they never farmed or hunted, but yet had food, weapons, and they even had maps of the land. So yeah, it seemed like the soldiers were magically summoned deities from some nether place. So cults appeared, especially after the soldiers departed. The indigenous wanted the soldiers to come back as they often traded and offered them supplies they'd never seen. So, like any cult, they developed rituals. Islanders prayed and built shrines, and soldiers would return sometimes, instilling the belief that those rituals were working. But when the war ended, the soldiers didn't come back at all anymore. Like the gods of myth, they disappeared. Many endured anyway, hoping if they prayed hard enough and they waited long enough, if they do the right things, their god will return. If Christians have been waiting for Jesus for 2,000 years, why is waiting for John from any sillier, you know? Perhaps the most the notable cult is the John Frum, one on the island of Onatu. John Frum is depicted as an American World War II serviceman who may or may not be real and brings wealth and prosperity to his followers. But he also seems to live in a volcano, is a spirit, knows everything, and is stronger than Jesus. If you remember the Prince Philip movement from the Bizarre Cults Part 1 video, John Frum is supposedly his dad. A film student was exploited by the cult leader to film their cult's journey, so when he escaped, he showed the world. It's Buddha Field. And they got aired the hell out in a recent documentary called Holy Hell, and I cannot emphasize enough how much you guys should go watch it. When Will Allen, then 22 years old, was forced to leave home in 1985 after his mother learned he was gay, his sister, who was attending a meditation group in West Hollywood, invited him along. He had no idea he would remain on its commune for 22 years documenting Buddha Field, a Los Angeles cult with hundreds of its members and a narcissistic sociopathic leader named Michelle Rostad, a ballet master with no real talent and a lot of daddy's money. He was a predator through and through, and the character angle to all followers was the knowing, a ritual in which Michelle would transfer his energy to the participants so they would truly know God. I don't need to say it, you guys can already guess what that was. The group would work, live, and meditate together, abandoning family and outside commune in hopes of finding greater enlightenment together. Their spiritual guru would in turn psychologically destroy and brainwash his disciples on a daily basis under the guise of new age spirituality that he regurgitated in a twisted way. As the years passed, male members began to realize the hypnotic cleansing sessions run by Michelle were actually fronts for their exploitation. With his cult crumbling, Michelle fled to Hawaii in 2007 with a handful of his most loyal supporters, and now he teaches yoga on a beach and does the same thing all over again, but hiding from Will and his camera instead of lavishing in front of it. All right, so let's take a little break from the harmful freaks and instead meet the first Presbyterian Church of Elvis the Divine. That's a mouthful. Thankfully, it has a convenient acronym, which is FPCED, and they start celebrating the birth of Elvis on December 8th which 
is incidentally the date that John Lennon, one of Elvis's 13 disciples, is killed. I wish they had an organized gospel online so I can learn the names of all the other Elvis disciples. I also learned that three bluesmen visited the baby Elvis and offered him gifts as a baby just like Jesus. Furry gave the baby a gallon of cheap wine. John Lee Hooker gave the child pills of many colors. And Robert Johnson offered a can of lard. Furry's a blank. I don't know who that's supposed to be. Sermons like the hot dog, nature's most perfect food, are designed to help believers remain steadfast in their faith. Also, a follower of Elvis would be remiss to leave out the 31 commandments, 31 foods that the followers of Elvis must keep in their homes in case he's ever in the neighborhood. Presbyterians are also required to face Las Vegas once a day and make a pilgrimage to the Graceland at least once in their lives. And true to form, there's an anti-Elvis, which is uh, laughably Lisa Marie, and the unholy union. Also, the anti-Elvis demons like Wayne Newton and Madonna, and believers of Elvis must renounce them. And now, back to the sad reality that people suck and harm each other. Next cult is Holy Rollers, which actually isn't their name, but it was the Brides of Christ, but these guys earned that fun nickname for the fact their church sermons were unintelligible moaning, shouting, and tongues while they convulsed and rolled around for hours. It was the first known cult in Oregon, and it started in the 1900s by a dude named Edmund Kreffield, who fled Germany to avoid the draft, and spun a story that he was a messenger sent straight from God, and that it was his religious duty to convert people to his radical form of Christianity. At the height of their frenzy, he and his followers lit a massive bonfire in the middle of the street to burn all their worldly possessions and a stray dog or two. Edmund was charismatic, flashy, and charming. His following slowly expanded on the promise he spoke directly to God, and his anointed ones would be spared of an apocalypse. And it expanded full of hot rich chicks. Not like Edmund was a looker or anything, but he had game, I guess, and he saw that. So he took opportunity to convince them that they need to be purified by him and his magical junk. And the rumors of that spread fast in the small town. So the husbands, fathers, and brothers of the female followers banded together to tar and feather him, and Edmund somehow survives and comes back to town. It was illegal to commit adultery back then, so the law was on his tarred and feathery ass. They eventually find him hiding naked under one of his followers' houses and send him to jail. And the second he steps foot outside of it in 1906, he gets popped by one of his female followers' brothers, who's acquitted because even the prosecutor was like, yeah, this cult leader had it coming. How about we go even farther back to an even older cult, the one that caused the Taiping Rebellion, which was a 14-year-long battle known to be the second or third deadliest conflict in history, claiming between 10 and 50 million lives. So from childhood, Hong Chia Kwan dreamed of being a Mandarin in the imperial court. He fails four times at the examinations and that somehow gave him the revelation that he was the literal son of God and the younger brother to Jesus. Normally they'll do the literal opposite to a person's confidence, but hey, all the power to you. So he starts preaching and stuff, destroying Confucian and Buddhist items and believing that he and his followers had been chosen to conquer China and establish the heavenly kingdom of harmony and peace. And it's heavily inspired by a Christian agenda and declared his own translation adaption of the Bible an authentic religion that existed in ancient China before being replaced by Confucianism. He aimed to convert the Chinese people to the Taiping's version of Christianity and overthrow the ruling dynasty. So obviously the emperor can't be having that and the rebellion starts because he sends some officers over there to deal with the call. By 1860, Hong's heavenly kingdom extended across China and his troops were preparing to march on Shanghai. His impressive army of millions rivaling Kink's own military and taking conscription of nearly every Taiping citizen and 14 years of bloodshed that permanently weakened all the dynasties. Whatever. Next. Loser. Many have experienced the awful neighbor with drum kit. In this case, it was Sachiko Ito, whose story begins with a deadbeat husband who blows out his back and decides to never do anything again, promptly bankrupting and deserting in 1992, leaving Sachiko Ito to care for their daughter alone. Shortly before his spectacular meltdown, Ito and him had been involved in a type of spiritual faith healing that has ties to Shinto, and they got kicked out of that for fraud. But she used what she learned there and those magical powers in fraud in Tsukugawa to, to perform supposed spiritual healings as a proclaimed psychic. And so the sheeple came and her regular devotees watched her escalate claims all the way to the point that she says she's a god with the power to drive demons away with drums. Her with drums. Her numbers grew and she got like 20 people living in her house. Her neighbors are complaining about all the cars parked on the street and about the incessant drum kit at all hours of day and night. But they're not complaining to her. Everyone was terrified of her. She used her taiko drum kits to literally drum on a person to chase out devils. And only Ito knew what and who had those devils. 
rituals. Like the woman who once eyed her boyfriend wantingly, she had demons for sure. Yeah. These rituals in reality kept her followers in line, and the extent of this ritual wasn't known until a follower ended up in the hospital for extreme injuries, and police go search the commune. They find six bodies, all mummified and wrapped into futons and tatami mats, and all had passed from Ito's drumming rituals. When they were asked why they didn't dispose of the bodies and instead kept them in the cult house, she explains that since the souls weren't dead, we just left them alone. On September 27, 2012, she was 65 years old and sentenced to death by rope, and the first woman to be executed in Japan in 15 years. Do you believe Jesus is a lizard and you're too poor to sign up for the big S cult? Well, rest assured, there are some cheaper alternatives like superior universal alignment. And in all honesty, it doesn't exist anymore, so no joining them. Sorry for getting your hopes up with my Jesus is a reptilian opinion viewers, which was also the opinion of Valentina de Andre, who thought Jesus was from Mars and started a cult in the 1980s Brazil to share that he would return to rescue believers before the apocalypse. Anyone who followed her word would be saved. Valentina somehow built a following who was forced to leave their families behind and abandon their children for her. A following that even listened to her conviction that males born after 1981 were the embodiment of all evil and had to be exterminated as payment for these beings who would save them. Why 1981? I don't know. Why the male sex? I don't know. She's crazy. Not me. Meanwhile, the Amazonian town Ultramira is having a sudden increase in missing men and boys. By 1994, the reports rose to 19 in total, and make matters worse, five bodies of boys had been found in terrible conditions, but none of them were the ones who had been reported missing. All police efforts were futile until one day, someone shows up to the police having escaped captors. Stories of black market organs, strange mutilations, and demonic rituals all show up, and when the culprits are identified, they're all respected members of society. What's new? Since it happened on a remote town, it took 11 years to solve this case. The authorities capture four of the identified captors, but Valentina managed to flee the country. After some years, she's finally arrested, and nobody really knows what happens to her after that. Not many people know that quite a few of our modern religions actually did start as cults, and had to exist as a long time before being included in census or religious categories. Not the case for Pastafarianism. You guys probably didn't think I would do it, and I'm doing it. The church was founded in 2005, when 24-year-old Bobby Henderson sent a letter to the Kansas State Board of Education because they were teaching the theory that the universe was created by intelligent entity in science class, which is the exact opposite of science, which Bobby explained, stating that because intelligent design uses ambiguous references to an official creator, the universe could very possibly be created by a flying spaghetti and meatballs monster, so they should teach that too. When he received no response from the Board of Education, he posted his letter on his website and other online forums explaining this perspective and how science and religion need to be kept separate, and an internet sensation and religious cult was born. So to answer some questions you may have, heaven and hell still do exist. In Pastafarian heaven, there is a beer volcano and an exotic dancer factory. Pastafarian hell, the beer is stale, and the exotic dancers have diseases. There are patron saints, they're all pirates. Followers were dressed like pirates, pirates are religiously revered and believed to be peace-loving explorers and spreaders of goodwill. Also, global warming is the result of a decreasing number of pirates. Don't forget your bible, it's called the Loose Canon, a compilation of texts similar in style to the traditional bible, such as Suggestions 1-1. I am the flying spaghetti monster. Monster. Thou shalt have no other monster before me. Afterwards is okay, just use protection. The only monster who deserves capitalization is me. Other monsters are false monsters, undeserving of a capitalization. Baba Henderson estimates his religion has actually about 80,000 followers. Pastafarianism is officially recognized in three as the religion in three countries, Poland, Netherlands, and New Zealand. So that's a hard one to follow up, but the story is one of the craziest things you'll ever hear, and it stars Magdalena Solis. And it's starts with con men Hernandez brothers arriving in sleepy Yerba Buena village. No school, no police, no church. A, fit, a group of 20 families, the perfect victims. So they claim to be prophets of ancient Incan gods that could deliver the people riches and used sleight of hand tricks and strange fake cave rituals and hemp laced incense to manipulate and convince these villagers, who then acted as their servants. However, as the months go by and there's no gold, some villagers begin questioning the Hernandez brothers suppose power. So in order to keep the scam going, the brothers told the villagers that they would leave, go talk to their gods, and come right back with a goddess. In a nearby town, they find teen working girl and charlatan psychic Magdalena Solis, who eagerly agrees to join the scam. They make a grand entrance of her, nighttime, cloud of smoke, dressed in gold. They really sold it to the villagers, who now would do anything they wanted. And man, these guys wanted some perverse stuff. Substance being the main. The three really got hard into it, and under the influence,
influence. So Leia's now believed she really was a goddess, specifically the reincarnation of the Aztec mother goddess. She demanded followers to do animal sacrifice, then drink the blood, then engage in group sessions, use substances, and then human sacrifice, ancient Aztec style, cutting the hearts out of her victims while they're alive kind of style. And one night a young boy stumbles across this and goes back home and forces a police officer from his town to go see it with him. Days go by, they don't return. Remembering the horror the boy described, other police officers bring an army contingent with them and go to the cave on May 31st, 1963, just in case. It essentially starts as a substance bus. Solis and the Hernandez brothers found cooked off their faces with a bunch of stuff they shouldn't have. This Hernandez, Santos, refused to be taken alive. Villagers panic, engage in firearms with police, results in more loss of life. Eight sacrifice victims are found altogether, the boy and the officer included. Eight more bodies are never found. The Solea says, along with Santos Hernandez and the other villages arrested in a raid, stood trial. None of the villagers would testify against her, so Magdalena was only convicted for the police officer and the young boy. A 50 year sentence. Alright, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you've been enjoying this creepy crawly content recently, and be sure to like and subscribe to see more.